west coast uh, sir uh, uh, excel group has uh, some deployments uh, and cultivation uh, in uh, gujarat as well as uh, now they are setting up in the ratnagiri coast sir. okay west coast yes hmm. west coast sir. east coast we are yet no. to find some part. east coast you can uh, just check with any contacts of yours in vizag because a complete thing from bimli patnam to this thing they, uh, to vizag on sir. the coast they have farms uh, shrimp farms and a lot of export goes from there sir one of our uh, nec seniors ajay wadekar is also into this uh, he is our nec senior so he has also assured me and when you need help so i'm just trying to, because sir, we'll have to uh, get some local support uh, so yeah, local that's what i said once you see what is there then the, what is the local support you're looking for then we can you know get somebody interested in it sir so we are also working with uh, a livelihood expert because we also have to provide something for the local community there sir because there has to be something in return for their support so we have uh, we are in touch with a, a lady who has been into livelihood promotion and livelihood uh, management so hopefully we'll have some good answers to that but planning you are basically going to do it in the sea water or finally going to fresh water uh, sir it has to both but uh, uh, i mean i am looking at one uh, immediate stage where that entire seamless data coming to our server and the analysis and those pre processing those issues and also sir continuous data monitoring those uh, require a bit of uh, we have identified a okay. vendor in indonesia who is going to supply the sensors to us so uh, all that is now finalized but we have yet to place the order because i'm just waiting for uh, uh, doing one okay i'm not and we'll discuss this later i think yes, your time is start. yes thank you uh, nishta all yours sure sir so hi good morning everyone uh, welcome to the day 2 of the webinar uh, so this webinar is being conducted by the mrc team uh for the summer interns uh, that we have had uh, for quite a long time now for almost 2 months and the internship ended just yesterday and uh, post that we've decided that we'll allow our interns to share their projects uh the outcomes of the projects that they undertook while uh, interning at MRC so keeping that in mind uh, today is the day 2 and uh, we'll have uh, day 3 and day 4 uh, tomorrow and day after where are not just the interns we also have our fellows who will be presenting and similarly we had presentations by our interns and fellows yesterday so summing up about yesterday we had some really good presentations by our fellows including sanskar soni and uh, romit kavre uh, both of whom uh, presented on presented on topics including msp and sediment classification uh, respectively then we also had good presentations by interns from iit delhi including akshita mangal and uh, then we also had uh, uh, Akshay Mondal from IIT Kharagpur who has who had presented uh, details on wind and precipitation noise in the three three D ambient noise estimation model. So going forward on the day two, we have presentations uh, from our interns and uh, the uh, the most uh, like the broader topic of today's presentations is going to be area production and yield analysis and climate change. So with uh, look now, I would like to call Soumya from IIT Delhi to present. Uh, the outcomes of her uh, internship that she took under MRC's guidance, and uh, she, the topic for her presentation is going to be Android application for API analysis of shrimp, shrimp farm, shrimp farming tool demonstration. So, Soumya, you can start your presentation, please. Good morning, everyone. I am Soumya, summer intern at MRC. I am currently pursuing BTEC from IIT Delhi. So my topic is digital tool for API analysis for shrimp and seaweed farming. So the flow of my presentation start with introduction and its objective, and then working of the Android application. Next area is production trend and yield parameter relationship, and then usage and application, and last the graphical user interface of the tool and its demonstration. 
so talking about the aquaculture it is a rapid growing industry that plays a vital role in the meeting of global demand for seafood the study aims to conduct apy analysis that it area production and yield analysis focusing on aquaculture in the indian air ocean region to determine a sustainable growth rate so the main objective of this project is to develop an android application for apy analysis for shrimp and seaweed farming so the application aims to provide farmers and researchers with a user friendly interface to analyze and predict area production and yield for the same while leveraging the power of mobile technology the application aims to enhance accessibility and convenience allowing users to access the result on their smartphones so talking about the tools the apy analysis tools offers main mainly two functionalities available data analysis and parameter based analysis so the first part of the tool available data analysis allows farmers and researchers to analyze growth trends identify regions with negative growth patterns and assess investment risk next is the parameter based analysis it involves in establishing and verifying relationship between yields and various parameters influencing production so the farmers and researchers can determine optimal parameters values for maximizing yield and promoting sustainable farming practices so the working of the android application involves uh, the it is developed using android studio ide which provides the comprehensive set of tools and features for building android application it utilizes amazon web service that is aws for cloud storage the re relevant data required for apy analysis such as growth trends environmental factors and farming parameters all the required input parameters are stored on the cloud uh, it uses api calls to retrieve real time data from the cloud storage this eliminates the need for manual input of parameters by farmers such as mm, uh, uh, farming parameters uh, as the application automatically fetch the required data for uh, the same next is its user friendly interface it is designed with a user friendly interface making it easy for farmers to interact with the tool the interference uh, interface includes a uh, clear navigation instruction and display for apy analysis result so the first part of the tool is area yield production trend it examines growth patterns in area yield and production it assesses instability and risk by identifying regions with negative growth pattern or high variability in production so the input required in this part of the tool is the species name and the state and the tool outputs the production growth rate and the area production and productivity cv and apy correlation that is area dependence and area effect with their values it also shows the graph that is production area and productivity with respect to the year of that species of that particular state next part of the tool is yield parameter relationship so it establishes and verify relationship between yield and parameter affecting yield it also identify the factor that influence the obtained yield in shrimp and seaweed farming it is important to figure out the optimum value of this parameter to maximize yield so the uh, input parameter that we have to select is basically only the species and uh, it basically live fetch the Uh, other input parameters through api calls like temperature stocking density salinity ph and like that and uh, the tool output growth rate and ex expected survival rate and whether it is optimal or not it basically shows all the observation related to that next talking about its uses and application of the tool so uh, first it allows real time data analysis and in the stability and risk assessment this enables farmers to make timely decision and adjustment to optimize their farming practice next is the farm, uh, parameter based analysis it establishes and verifies the relationship between yield and parameter parameter affecting yield so they can optimize their parameters to op maximize yield and profit profit next is it allows estimated production and yield on the input parameter so this information helps farmer plan uh, to plan and forecast their production allowing for better research allocation and decision making 
so this tool can be utilized by various stakeholders uh, including shrimp and seaweed farmers the primary users of the tool are the farmers themselves they can utilize the tool to analyze and optimize their production and yield next is the researcher and scientist researcher and scientist in the field of aquaculture can uh, utilize the tool for the data analysis and research purpose it provides them with valuable insights into growth patterns yield parameters and the overall performance of shrimp and seaweed farming next consult Consultants in the field of shrimp and seaweed farming can also employ the APY tool to assess the performance of farms, identify areas for improvement, and provide strategic recommendation to optimize production and profit. Next, industry association and organization involving in this field can also use this tool to gather data and insights on the performance of shrimp and seaweed farming at a regional or national level. So this information can be used for industry analysis, benchmarking, and policy making purposes. So this is the tool graphical user interface. So the first page shows the index page where we have to select the species, uh, whether it is shrimp or seaweed we want to know about. And next is the uh, selecting the option of state and species for which we want to know about. And after clicking on the calculate button, it shows the result that I mentioned in the previous slide, that is production growth rate with their values, areas, production and productivity CV, and uh, with the option with their graph. Next is the demonstration of the tool. Welcome to the Android application. This is the splash screen. Next is the first page that shows the button get started with the tool. After clicking on that, here is the registration page that will ask for name, email, phone number, password for successful registration. In case of existing user or already have an account, there is a sign in option at the bottom of the page. After clicking on that, the page for signing in appears and it asks for email and password. After entering required details, it can be signed in. And we get an index page where there is option of shrimp and seaweed. So suppose I want to go for shrimp. Now there is both the option. Area is parameter, area is production trend that is APY trends and ill parameter relationship. So suppose I want to know about area in production trend that is APY trends for shrimp. So after clicking on next, we have to select the particular state and species. After selecting both, after clicking on continue and it shows the result page that is parameters with their values like production growth rate, area production, productivity, CV with their values and area dependence and effects with their values. It also shows the production area productivity graph with respect to year of that particular species and state. After clicking on production visual, the graph appears. Same for area visual, same for productivity visual. So at the top, there is button for sign out and also for going back. So next, I want to go for yield parameter relationship for sale. So clicking on the second button, it will ask for selecting a species of stream. After selecting the species through API calls, it will fetch required input parameters and then it shows the entire observation, including expected survival rate like that and whether it is optimal or not. So this is all for stream. Similarly, we can go for seaweed after clicking on that button. So if we want to sign out, here is the button at the top right side of the screen. After signing out, this page will appear. 
where there is option for signing in again and visit again. So if we click on visit again, it started at previously from first page. So that's all about demonstration. A few backend parts of the application are left as some data set for API calls are about to be uploaded on AWS. And last but not the least, I want to thank the uh, I want to thank the work of Slope Nemani for providing me the valuable data for the project. And concluding my project with the quote, no water, no life, no blue, no green by Dr. Sylvia Earl. Thank you. Thank you, Soumya. Thanks for your good presentation. Uh, now, before we move on to the next set of presentations, I would want to communicate uh, some ground rules for all the presenters today. Uh, all interns must note that the following. All interns must note the following and, and adhere to the time limit that has been allotted to you. So the first thing is that the duration of your presentation must not exceed exceed 15 minutes. Uh, second is that we will take all the questions at the end of all the presentations and uh, I have already shared a Google uh, document link in the chat section where you, you can visit the Google Doc and put in your questions over there. There's a table made. Uh, third is that each intern must introduce themselves and talk about their affiliations uh, and the research project that they are undertaking while, uh, while they were interning with MRC. And fourth is that two to three minutes between each presentation is accounted for extra time and the takeover by the next presenter. So these were certain points that I would request all the interns to keep in mind before they start with their presentations. So next, I would like to call Balaji from IIT Kharagpur, who will be uh, making a presentation on the topic digital tool for APY analysis of carp farming and demonstration. So Balaji, you can take over. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Kotindi Sai Balaji, a final year undergraduate at IIT Kharagpur from Economics Department, now currently working as an intern at MRC. My project at MRC is about digital tool for API analysis of carp farming. In this presentation, I will be following these contents. Introduction about my project, about the fish species I have focused on. Methods followed to produce carps. Analysis of carp farming in India. Future scope and demonstration of my digital tool I have developed. Moving on to the introduction, we know there are two types of water resources, namely marine, freshwater. In this project, I have mainly focused on freshwater resources. Uh, in India, over 70% of people live in rural areas where the main occupation is agriculture, but inland aquaculture makes significant contributions to their livelihood. Of about 85% of this aquaculture is contributed by carp and carps are economically valuable inland fisheries which have very high demand. This is the reason that I have focused on these carps species and farming, specifically Catla, Rohu and Mrigal species, also known as Indian major carps. And why this analysis and API tool? Well, because the data analysis provides many other growth patterns that from uh, traditional approach, vary from traditional approach. And the tool area production yield provides quantitative and quantitative information about the parameters required and how they are related. Now moving on to the carps that I have concentrated. Here, the three carps, Catla, Rohu and Miguel are almost similar size and the color of these carps are also uh, non-distinguishable as they have very minor differences that may or may not be detected without naked eye, without prior experience. So developing a fish detection will be really helpful to the farmers and farm owners. So I developed a fish detection that takes images as input of these species and with the help of backend Using ML technique, the image captured are preprocessed to apply normalization before passing them into training. These preprocessed data is trained using image classification, specifically fine tuning technique on top of bit transformer, vision transformer, and gives an output of which pieces that image belongs to. Now, moving on to the methods followed for forming, which will bring efficient output by inputting these efforts, namely. Pond preparation and fish sheet stocking. 
the pond preparation should be done in a way that before adding fish seeds all aquatic weeds in ponds must be perfectly removed and the feeding management should be done in such a way that feeding must start right away once pond is prepared with the seed stocking and the water quality parameters such as ph temperature dissolved oxygen salinity tds conductivity must be focused properly after the above key methods followed and properly maintained for few days uh, example for a month uh, assessment of fish growth performances and yield produced should be done now moving on to the apo tool i have developed by entering the species name and the parameters such as ph dissolved oxygen transparency water temperature optimum salinity tds conductivity in these specified units uh, example milligram per liter for dissolved oxygen it gives an output uh, whether the entire parameters are optimal or not if not optimal it also gives why they are not optimal and what range should be maintained this tool will be helpful to the farmers and stakeholders by making their work easier and also helps them how parameters are correlated these are the uh, important observations about the optimum parameters the ph should be maintained uh, from 6 to 9 ph for all the species uh, 48 mg per liter dissolved oxygen 25 to 40 cm transparency 10 to 35 degrees celsius temperature and optimum salinity of range 0 to 5 psu and also observe that the net profit for crop species from wild sources is greater than from the hatchery resources now let's discuss about the common diseases that crop suckers these are the common diseases for the crops i have discussed cattle roho and mickle uh, these are the diseases that commonly occurs and these diseases affects at different parts of the body of the fish uh, these are mainly caused by bacteria yeast algae and fungi in the water so the maintenance of hygiene is key otherwise the farms will get into huge loss huge amount of loss so the so to not get up infected by diseases for the fishes proper water management should be done now let's discuss about the analysis the data is taken from the fisheries department of india and the data shows uh, for the various states uh, for the uh, production of carp in the states of india vary a lot and found that these are the five top states uh, in the in, in india andhra pradesh west bengal uttar pradesh odisha and bihar this is due to flow of our famous rivers ganga brahmaputra godavari uh, i will briefly tell about the andhra pradesh how production of inland taken place in the past few two decades past two decades uh, the data shows a consistent upward trend uh, in between there is some minor differences uh, these are due to may it are due to mainly due to some policy makers or some policy changes in the field or maybe overall it shows steady increase in the past two decades for andhra pradesh and fish seeds production in million in andhra pradesh are also showing a increasing trend for most of the years and some fluctuations are due to environmental conditions market demand and due to some changes in the policy now we will be discussing about the future scope of this project we can perform disease detection with ai if there is more data available uh, i cannot perform this disease detection which which is more important because the data available in the web is significantly less and i am not able to perform this disease detection so that's why i have not done this future scope and the future scope is we can also concentrate on other inland species not only indian major crops cattle roho and mickle uh, and the other future scope is economic analysis of how imports and exports are done will also be great future work on the field of on the field of this as it contributes so much to the blue economy and also increases demand for fish than the usual and the other future scope is optimal feeding regime by this we are able to increase fish growth and decrease feed waste now i will demonstrate my 
web tool uh, in this web website there are four options available in the sidebar namely analysis api tool fish detection diseases etc uh, these are the four available parts of the website uh, in the analysis part there is overall graph uh, graph shown and it shows how the trend is going on for the year 2023 2022 and by selecting on which state we want to i will show the three required parameter and um, it will show the graphs of these three production of inland fish seeds produced for the past for the past two decades growth rate percentage and a brief summary uh, of the three param uh, three fields production of inland fish seeds growth rate and now moving on to api tool by selecting which species we want to concentrate by entering the parameters uh, for example for catla if we enter the ph of range 7.2 and salinity 0.13 dissolved oxygen 5.2 water temperature total dissolved solids and conductivity it will by clicking on the submit button it will show whether the farming is optimal or not and it leaves a message for the optimality conductivity must be in the range of 522 800 uh mu second uh, per centimeter fish detection this is the uh by inserting the image from our <coughs> local host it will it will do the back end by ml by using the fine tuning technique it will show uh, which species it belongs to by capturing the image here it shows the migel as we inserted the migel body uh yes, this is about the fish detection and the diseases uh diseases blog uh, where we have different species and what type what type of diseases it may occur and precautions and cure mm. this is the demonstration of my video uh thank you i will conclude my presentation with this thank you thanks balaji for your presentation and the demonstration as well next can we have radhika agarwal from rukki it rukki with us uh, she is going to be speaking on economic impact of climate change on seaweed and shrimp farming radhika you can take over hello everyone uh, myself radhika agarwal and i am from it rukki uh, currently pursuing economic sciences uh, so my topic is economic impact of climate change on uh, shrimp farming uh, these are the contents of my slides uh, introduction to shrimp farming effects of climate change shrimp production area under cultivation of india study and work conclusion and references so uh, shrimp farming is an agriculture business that exists in either marine or freshwater environments producing shrimp for human consumption so uh, what uh, these are the water conditions which are required from shrimp farming so uh, shrimp uh, climate change has a very great impact on uh, in, uh, shrimp production and the exports of shrimp and so here how are we assessing the climate change climate change refers to long term shifts in temperature and weather patterns and because of these things climate change we are assessing is, uh, by green increased greenhouse gas emissions leading to hotter temperatures intensity and changes of precipitation events rising sea levels and changes in acidity and salinity of water bodies in our study we have uh, included seven states of india namely west bengal odisha andhra pradesh kerala karnataka goa and maharashtra 
the below map uh, shows the production and the area and the cultivation statistics of these states uh, from the uh, these map it is quite visible that uh, andhra pradesh is the highest producer of shrimp in india nearly contributing to 40% of the total produce the production and uh, growth of shrimp depend upon various factors and uh, majorly upon the water quality parameters like temperature water salinity ph dissolved oxygen content uh, feed quality water depth level ammonia and nitrogen concentration and carbon dioxide concentration uh, so water temperature uh, should be in the range 26 to 32 degrees celsius for optimal growth ph should be in the range of 7 to 8.7 Salinity should be between 10 to 25 ppt. Dissolved oxygen should be between 3.5 to 4.5 ppm. And carbon dioxide concentration should be less than 10 ppm. So uh, I have used a statistical model for the study and uh, which proposes various hypotheses. And this table shows the hypothesis which has been proposed. The next table shows the hypothesis, the correlation coefficient, and the conclusion uh, or the result which we uh, drew from the uh, data which we collected. So, uh, first hypothesis was production of shrimps have a positive impact on greenhouse gas emissions. The correlation coefficient was 0.25 and the hypothesis was true with mild positive correlation. The second, core, uh, the second hypothesis was intense rainfall has a negative impact on the production of shrimp. Uh, coefficient was minus 0 0.33 with, and the hypothesis is true uh, and it showed the mild negative correlation. Then third hypothesis was production and exports of shrimp are positively related. Its correlation coefficient is 0 0.41. Uh, conclusion was that uh, the hypothesis is true uh, and it has moderate positive correlation and next hypothesis was uh, high rainfall has a negative effect on the exports of shrimp the correlation coefficient is uh, minus 0 0.43 and the hypothesis is true with moderate uh, negative correlation let's uh, move on the interpretation of these results so the first one is that a production of shrimps has a positive impact on greenhouse gas emissions. By this, uh, we mean that as the production and area under cultivation of shrimps increases, greenhouse gas emissions also increase. Uh, the reason uh, for this is that a lot of mangroves are being cut down to convert them into shrimp ponds as the demand for shrimp is increasing day by day. Because of this activity, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions take place. The above results show that there is a positive causality which runs from production of shrimp to greenhouse gas emissions. But previous studies have also shown that there is a negative causality which runs from greenhouse gas emissions to the production of shrimps, implying that if greenhouse gas emissions increase, the production of shrimps also decreases. So we can conclude that there is a bidirectional uh, causality between production of shrimps and greenhouse gas emissions. Moving towards interpretation of next hypothesis, intense rainfall has negative impact on production of shrimp. This hypothesis is true. And uh, according to the result, it shows mild negative correlation between uh, high rainfall and production of shrimp. As the greenhouse gas emissions are causing excessive warming of climate, due to which more moisture is held in the atmosphere, leading to heavier rainfall. The changing climate alters the atmospheric pressure systems such as jet, stream, jet streams, hence affecting the precipitation patterns because jet streams and winds play a crucial role in, determine, in determining them. Rainfall leads to decrease in 5 to 6 degree Celsius of temperature in the environment. It can be much lower in massive low pressure systems. So shrinks are cold-bedded organisms and they adapt the uh, temperature which is uh, of the environment because of this uh, they might, the uh, temp body temperature of shrimps might decrease and it might lead to their death 
also higher rains decrease the salinity of water which can be fatal for shrimp growth as a decrease in salinity leads to lower pathogen resistance in shrimps and can cause disease outbreaks uh, our third hypothesis was production and exports of shrimp are positively related this hypothesis was true and had a moderate uh, positive correlation uh this implies that as the production increases the exports will also increase india is the second largest producer and exporter of shrimp in the world india is top exporter to us accounting for 38% of shrimp exports in 2022 the global shrimp market size uh, reached us dollar 65.9 billion in 2022 uh, and it is expected that the market will reach us dollars 87.9 billion by 2028 as the graph shows that exports have been increasing from 2013 to 2020 and further uh, in 2022 as per the statistics the shrimp production has increased so if the production of shrimp decreases because of various factors climatic factors leading to shrimp mortality uh the export would also decrease and the fluctuation in exports affect the aquaculture economy fisheries and aquaculture contribute about uh, 1% of india's gdp and 5% of india's agricultural gdp shrimp account for 75% of india's uh, sea exports the shrimp sector is the biggest contributor to india's fisheries export sector therefore this implies that uh, shrimps have a very significant impact on the exports uh, of india and also uh, has a significant impact on gdp another is uh, another result uh, which proves the hypothesis high that high rainfall has negative effect on the export is true but we also say that this relation is not direct but has an indirect impact as in uh, as the rainfall as uh, the rainfall increases export quantity decreases because as the intensity of rainfall increases uh, the production uh, decreases as proved by the above hypothesis and because of decrease in the production exports would also decrease and because of this we can conclude that high rainfall uh, has a negative impact on the exports this uh, flow chart depicts how exports can have a indirect as well as direct how exports can have an indirect uh, impact due to greenhouse gas emissions and direct uh, impact due to uh, production of shrimps the greenhouse gas emissions are responsible for climate change as well as changes in water parameters the water parameters like temperature salinity dissolved oxygen level and ph get easily altered due to climatic variations so uh, as a conclusion in future work we can say that uh, uh, climate change imposes a great and significant impact on uh shrimp production and exports climate change assessed by greenhouse gas emissions and extreme rainfall events have direct and indirect effects on the health of health and uh, growth of shrimps uh and uh, can pose adverse to deadly impact on the shrimps shrimp production and greenhouse gas emissions have bidirectional relationship therefore we conclude that climate change has an adverse impact on shrimp farming and the economy this study can be extended to as a future work can be extended to uh, other aquaculture species to understand the economic impact of climate change on them and this study leads to a future framework a future framework for policy interventions required to make shrimp farming more sustainable and eco friendly that's all from my side uh, thank you thank you radhika next i would like to call deepak from terry uh, deepak will be uh, presenting on the topic role of ud in mitigating effects of climate change on oceans deepak you can uh, share your screen just a second
Yeah. Am I uh, visible and audible both? Yes, you are. Yeah. So good morning to all. My name is Deepak Kumar and I'm pursuing sustainable development in the field of, uh, from the Energy Resource Institute, New Delhi. So at MRC, I'm looking at uh, the role of UDA in mitigating effects of climate change on oceans. So here's a peek of what my content table might look like. Introduction, indicators of climate change, methodology, study area, findings, and need of UDA. So uh, sorry to start you all with a gloomy picture. And uh, with uh, actually, it means no disrespect towards the Paris Agreement. But I, it's not enough. The 1.5 degree that uni, uh, unanimously was agreed at COP21, would it suffice with respect to oceans? This is a pertinent question that needs to be asked even further now. So coming back to the introduction, uh, we all know that huge role that oceans play into Earth and life itself. Like uh, they play a vital role in Earth's climatic system, storing and transporting heat, fresh water, and carbon, just to name a few. Now, as we all know, because of emissions of greenhouse gases since the Industrial Revolution, uh, the Earth has been heating up, and most of the heat has been stored by the ocean itself. But uh, the thing is, with vast mass and heat capacity, ocean circulation and interactions with atmosphere have a profound impact and climate variability and changes. So the ocean, as the ocean changes, its impact on the atmosphere and our human life will change as well. And it's we are not talking about a change, uh, a change of one degree or two degree. Even point one degree would lead to changes which would be catastrophic in nature for the humankind and all the marine organization and the ecosystem itself. Uh, so why indicators? So because these are the most plausible sources to identify what has been happening because of the greenhouse emissions. Uh, indicators such as ocean acidification, oxygen depletion, pollution, and other stresses are creating complex and unpredictable interactions. This, this is the gist of thing: complex and unpredictable interaction, potentially leading to sh a drastic shift in ocean composition and functions. There has been policy about the oceans as well. Like uh, UNFCC in 2016 came up with this, and there's also the mention of sustainable development goal under 14.3. So coming back to the indicators, so. There could be a plethora of indicators that can be chosen from, such as algal bloom, phytoplanktons, coral reefs, uh, coral bleaching. But I have, uh, I have incorporated these five indicators because of the fact of universality. As we all know, algal blooms and coral reefs are both limited with respect to their... Uh, uh, because corals actually do... Uh, Corals happen only at a specific temperature and in a photic zone. Whereas sea surface temperature, ocean heat content, ocean acidification, dissolved oxygen content, uh, concentration, and mean sea level is these are the factors which can be actually studied all across the globe, and they will show some or the other results as well. So coming to first indicator, sea surface temperature. The basic reason as the greenhouse gas traps more energy from the sun, the oceans are absorbing more heat, resulting in an increase in sea surface temperature. For a better part of uh, the decade, it has been said that the sea surface temperature has been growing around 4% for the depth of footing zone, 0 to 200 meter depth. And uh, at, at the top, uh, 75 meters, the rate of warming is 0 0.11. It may vary with locations as well. Coming back to the, uh, coming to the second indicator, ocean heat content. Uh, this works on the same principle as the sea surface temperature. But uh, compared to sea surface temperature and global mean surface temperature records, OSC shows larger signal to noise ratio and is less impacted by natural variability. Therefore, OSC is better suited to detecting and attributing human influences than other climatic records. But OSC has its own set of limitations as well. The first OSC time series was published in the year 2000. However, the early global OSC time series shows significant decadal variability, especially a warm period from 70s to 80s. So this is a few limitation, and it has been corrected in the year 2016 by uh, changing from XBT to MBT. But uh, as it is still in the process, it's uh, as of as far as I'm concerned, this wouldn't hold the edge over sea surface temperature. Coming to the third uh, indicator, ocean acidification. Acidification is nothing new to the uh, oceans, nor the Earth as a system. It is an anthropogenic process, but uh, this this rate has been changed and has been um, in, it has been an increasing trend from 8.2, which used to be the uh, ocean pH, it has gone down to 8.1. And if projections are to be considered, by 2021, the rate will enhance even further from, from 0.1 to 0.4 pH. 
Now, uh, ocean uh, dissolved oxygen concentration. Ocean uh, can only gain oxygen at the surface by air seed gas exchange and photosynthesis. Thereafter, the subsurface dissolved oxygen is advected along water masses distribution. Therefore, any change in solubility at the surface due to warming, decrease of ventilation due to uh, stratification increase and increase in deep ocean respiration due to increased surface primary production can lead to ocean deoxygenation. Uh, these two vary, as in if we try to uh, figure out the dissolved oxygen concentration in the coastal regions, uh, they wouldn't be the same and they would not show the, uh, show the same trajectory and trend as compared to the mid-ocean region because of the local factors such as runoff, rivers, nutrients and uh, trade tides as well, to name a few. Uh, but still, the rate of decrease varies, but overall it has to be considered the rate has been declining 2% over the last 30 years and this, this has a huge impact on the marine ecosystem. Finally, the last one, mean sea level. Uh, this is the longest continuously operating ocean observation method, is the measurement of mean sea level. As you can see in the globe, it will be very hard to find any blue spot in here. This means that the sea level trend overall has been on a rise. It's simply a bad news for the those countries, and it, it will be a bad news to all, but it will simply obliterate those countries which have a ground level similar to that of sea level. And uh, if if IPCC report has to be considered, from 1901 to 1919, the trend was 1.4 millimeter per year, whereas in the last 17, uh, from 1993 to 2015, in just 17 years, the trend has increased to 3.2 millimeter per year. So this shows that the intensification has been going at a far more, uh, at a rate which which is beyond any trajectory, like for 90 years it was 1.4 and for 17 years it's doubled, more than doubled actually. So the methodology coming to the topic, why I'm all, uh, doing all this. So it's a, a descriptive research design to analyze the trends of sea surface temperature and cyclones as indicators of climate change. And for data collection purposes, various scientific uh, databases were explored. Uh, most of my data for cyclones came from IMD and for sea surface temperature salinity and other aspects came from NOA websites. Data analysis for, for this purpose, statistical analysis, uh, statistical analysis is conducted to examine the trends in sea surface temperature and cyclone activity. Uh, the frequencies of cyclones and their severity are assessed to understand their relationship with climate change. Now, the study area, the study area for my research is Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal, uh, to be more precise, latitude ranging zero to 23 degree north in the Arabian Sea and longitude of 60 to 72.5 degree east. And for Bay of Bengal, 0 to 18 and 82 to 95.5 degree east. So this is the finding of sea surface temperature of Arabian Sea and the trajectory uh, linear progression. So uh, the years have been divided in a decadal basis from 55 to 64 and so on and so forth. The sea surface temperature, as you can see from the data itself, it may not show a huge turnaround. If, if the mean has to be calculated, it shows a rise of 0 0.11 degrees Celsius and uh, R square value is 0 0.80. So it is quite definitive that if all other things in, in terms of economics set is paragus, then in the next two decades, the temperature is going to rise even further. And for Bay of Bengal, it, 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 uh, the findings is quite contrary to what I was uh, hoping for and uh, what most of the literature stated that Bay of Bengal had always been warmer and it can be seen like for the year 55 to 64 it was already at 28 and a half but for the same time period the Arabian Sea was trying to touch 28 degrees Celsius so there was a difference Arabian Sea is cooler in terms of sea surface temperature as compared to Bay of Bengal because of its simple geography Bay of Bengal is surrounded by land and because of that it has more sea surface temperature and uh, so as per this, the basic premise of cyclogenesis, uh, cyclogenesis would lead us to formulate a simple but pragmatic hypothesis. That is, with increasing sea surface temperature, there is bound to be emergence of more tropical depression, because that's how it works. But an analysis of cyclone data would show the result to be otherwise, in case of Arabian Sea as well. Although Arabian Sea has been showing a sea surface temperature to be in a progressive curve. But... Uh, even and even the cyclone that has hit both eastern and western coast has been declining for the last uh, 60 years. It, uh, I'll explain this uh, in the next part as well. The results, however, highlighted a pattern that through the frequency, though the frequency may not be increasing, but the severity of cyclones are increasing at an alarming rate.
So these are the findings of cyclones. So from 55 to 60, uh, 55 to 2017 for both cyclones in Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea. I would like to make the distinction clear here because many other research papers have been showing the results to be otherwise. So uh, I'm trying to locate the impact. So for that, I'm not looking at cyclone genesis, like in terms of genesis of cyclones, but the cyclones which actually go on and hit the coast. So it has been on a declining trend for both Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal. As we can see from this table, the East Coast and the West Coast, total number of cyclones from 1891 to 54 received 168 and 17. Uh, respectively for both eastern and western coast, whereas the severity for eastern coast was 26.78% and western coast was 35.29. As you can see from 55 to 2017, the total number of cyclones that has hit both eastern and western coast has shown a declining trend. But on the other hand, severity has risen from 26.78 to 59.1 and from 35 to 80%, showing a change of two, uh, twice the change for eastern coast and almost two and a half times for the western coast. Whereas if we see the correlation between the number of cyclones and even for severity, it will show a, uh, no, uh, if we see the correlation between sea surface temperature, sea surface temperature and severe cyclone, it would show a decreasing trends. So how can UDA pave the way? Uh, I am very uh, positive that all the dignitaries in, present in the audience and all the interns as well know pretty much about UDA, but still a small gist of what UDA is. UDA sits on four pillars, security, blue economy, disaster management, and science and technology. If we look at all these pillars, standalone point of view, these answers a lot of questions and solves a lot of, uh, and provides a lot of solutions. But combined together, as has been said in the introduction as well about the ocean systems, that the changing uh, environment makes it more and more difficult to predict and more and more complex as we go on further. So we act, and this will be actually paved, uh, this will be actually communicated later in other slides as well. So the role of UDA, how can UDA actually take uh, cater to such discrepancies and such severities of cyclones? Uh, with early detection of climate change indicators, the UDA can provide real time or near real time data on ocean temperature, acidity, salinity, and other key parameters by incorporating uh, sensor technologies and data collection system as has been highlighted by many of my peers. Now, uh, identification of vulnerable areas. It's as we said, the climate change and its impact are not uh, evenly distributed all around the globe. So it has more vulnerable areas. This is where UDA can uh, highlight that region that it requires immediate attention and conservation efforts. Suppose if we can see that Arabian Sea has more severe cyclones, then it's high time that the infrastructure based on uh, UD uh, based uh, located in the Arabian Sea would require tremendous change and assessment of biodiversity and ecosystem health. As we have said that ocean acidification and dissolved oxygen concentration would lead to dwindling population of marine ecosystem. And they too have a large part to play in the ocean absorption of oxygen itself. Uh, finally, informing policy decision, a policy and decision making, coming back to that gloomy picture of Paris climate change. For more part of our uh, civilization, we have been following a more curative approach than preventive approach. And this, would be even uh, this would go even a, a step further because if we don't even know what the interactions are and how it is happening we won't be able to predict neither the curative effort would come in handy so this is uh, where i would like to leave you history repeats itself first is tragedy second is farce as was said by karl marx now look at uh, if i can dial back the clock to 24 years the year was 1999 that's when the super cyclone hit Odisha's coast. Uh, Odisha's coast. More than 10,000 people died and the loss of property was in millions. But thereafter, better detection due to remote sensing and other activities. Now, at this point of time, as we have, uh, as we have looked at the result, the severity has been rising. So there has been, there has been actually more cyclone uh, that has hit both, both eastern and western coast. But none has matched the loss of life and property that was seen in the 1999. Because of better detection system, now we know that when the cy uh, cyclone is forming, where it's headed and when it is going to hit. So we can make a better and more informed decision about the cyclones and preventive measures as well. And coming back to the current year, 2023, talking about the intricate relation and the more complex relation. So 2023 is an El year. That means for the Indian context, it will be going to be a year of scanty rainfall. But on the contrary, the news reports all highlight that North India, uh, North India has been submerged underwater. And why is that so? Because El Nina 
presumably, uh, presumably, all the time at health reset, El Nino would lead to spontaneous input. But there's another pattern that develops far away from India, that is in Mediterranean, known as the Western disturbances. They carry the moisture-laden winds towards the Indian coast because of the pressure difference. But this, this is, it, this may seem more simple, but it isn't. Western disturbances doesn't hit the Indian subcontinent usually during the monsoon part. So the change in temperature is going to show some uh, some uh, results would not be able to decipher so easily. There, therefore, more research is needed, and based on that research, the de de development and deployment of tools have to be done, which I think MRC, uh, my other peers have been doing that, and thereafter a incorporation of the results and findings has to be highlighted in the policy aspect as well, so that we head towards the preventive measure rather than the curative one. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Thanks for your comprehensive presentation. Next, uh, I would like to call Akshay Bhivagare from IIT Kharagpur to make his presentation. Akshay, please uh, share your screen and your presentation and start. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. My name is Akshay Ramesh Bhivare. I am pursuing my MTech degree in Earth System Science and Technology, which comes under Center for Ocean, River, Atmosphere, and Land Sciences. Currently, I am working as an MRC intern. Uh, I am here to give the presentation on the topic of quantifying the impact of climate change on ocean acidification using machine learning. So uh, these are the content which I am going to follow in my presentation. Now coming to the introduction part. Ocean acidification is the process of increasing acidity of the seawater due to absorption of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Generally ocean water is little alkaline, but our present day ocean are getting more acid. Hence the pH of the surface ocean water has dropped by 0 0.1 unit since the industrial revolution. That might not sound like a lot, but the pH scale is logarithmic, not a linear one. So that 0 0.1 0 .1 drop is equivalent with 30% increase in the acidity. Ocean acidification is not a phenomenon that human can feel or see, but it literally changing the chemistry of the ocean and animals are not used to that. Now, why there is a need to study the ocean acidification? Ocean is act like a sponge. It absorbs nearly 30% of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. When, when absorbed carbon dioxide undergoes chain of chemical reaction, it reduces the availability of carbonate ion. Now, this ion, this carbonate ion are basically the building blocks for many marine species to make their shell, for example, crabs, uh, mussels, oyster, and also for the corals. Coral also need this carbonate ion in seawater to make their coral structure in order to build coral reefs. Because of fewer carbonate ion, it makes the shell of these animals weak, brittle, and deformed. Ocean acidification has indirect impact uh, or effect on marine life. Early life stage of fish can be particularly vulnerable to the ocean acidification. So they do not grow as quickly or as large as they can be grow in normal condition. It is also observed that the olfactory system uh, in fish, which is essential, uh, uh, like their ability to smell, can be impacted in some species. So they are not able to find food or avoid predators as effectively they can in normal condition. Ocean acidification also affects seafood industry and tourism. Now, coming to this part, uh, here is a, a uh, pteropods. It is called as a sea butterfly, uh, and it is an important food source in the ocean for many species from krill uh, to salmon uh, right up to whale. The shell of this pteropod was placed into the sea uh, seawater at a pH that were expected by the end of this uh, century in, in one of the uh, studies. And it is observed that after only 45 days, after only 45 days, at this very realistic pH value. Uh, you can see this uh, shell of has almost completely dissolved. 
so question answer division could affect right up, up through the food chain now this uh, this are the cold water coral they support rich biodiversity including some very important fisheries it, it is projected that by the end of the century 70 percent of all known cold water coral in the entire ocean will be surrounded by sea water that is dissolving their coral structure and same thing for uh, healthy tropical uh, coral uh, if we if we put uh, this healthy uh, tropical coral um, at the ph value uh, which we are expecting at the end of this century it gets dissolved completely in 6 months now coming to the objective part uh, the two main objective of my research are to create machine learning model that predict ocean ph more accurately than the traditional climate model and to use the model to discover new pattern in ocean acidification which will help us to better understand the impact and find way to mitigate its effect the existing climate model are earth system model biogeochemical model ocean circulation model assessing ocean acidification through the climate model poses challenges due to the need of accurately representing the complete biogeochemical processes and their interaction with the physical climate system. Also, parameterization of the subgrid scale processes such as bi bi biological processes and the carbonate chemistry dynamic present a challenges in accurately capturing the spatial and the temporal variability of ocean acidification in the climate model. Now, some of the limitation is overcome using machine learning model because machine learning model offers several advantage over the traditional climate model. Machine learning model captures the complex non-linear relationship and the interaction between the acidification factor uh, uh, leading to more accurate uh, prediction. Machine learning model reveals new pattern and insight about the ocean acidification, enhancing our understanding of its impact on the marine ecosystem. Now coming to the methodology part. So the methodology of my project involves data collection, data pre-processing, model selection, model training and testing, and model evolution. Now here I like to give some information about uh, the data set that I have chosen uh, for my study. Uh, I used a data set from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, for data analysis on several ocean characteristics. The input parameter for, the, uh, for my model uh, uh, is carbon dioxide. More specifically, I have uh, considered two values of carbon dioxide. One represents partial pressure of the carbon dioxide in the seawater under wet condition and other value um, uh, represents uh, the partial pressure of the carbon dioxide in dry condition. And also seawater, uh, sea surface temperature, uh, sea surface salinity. I mainly concentrated uh, in Bay of Bengal region. Uh, more specifically in the Indian Ocean region. Now coming to the data pre-processing part, to ensure the consistency, uh, eliminate any outlier or missing value, I have uh, pre-processed the data. From this, uh, from this figure, from this figure we can, uh, uh, we can say that the pH value of the ocean water is strongly negatively correlated with the CO2 that is carbon dioxide, sea surface temperature, and sea surface salinity. Now, for model evaluation, we used R2 score as a performance metric. R2 score commonly referred as the coefficient of determination. A higher score indicates a better fit of the model to the data. It typically goes from 0 to 1. Means if the value of R2 square close to 1, it represents the model fit the well. Uh, in a well manner. Now coming to the result part, I tried uh, with three uh, different models for my project, namely decision tree, random forest, XG bush. The R2 score for decision tree is approximately uh, equals to 0 0.92, and uh, for random for uh, sorry for XG bush it is uh, uh, nearly 0 0.95, and for random forest it, it is 0 0.96. So as I mentioned in previous slide that if R2 score is nearer to 1 means our model is performing very well and uh, using all, all three models my R2 score value is nearer to 1 means my model perform uh, performance of my model is well. 
now uh, uh, this graph shows the plot of actual ph value uh, versus predicted ph value using random forest now talking about the application of this model it can be used for the ocean acidification monitoring climate change study oceanography and ocean uh, engineering the model can be used to monitoring and predict the changes in the ph level uh, specifically uh, in the bay of bengal region this information is crucial for the understanding the impact of ocean acidification on marine ecosystem and their resilience climate change study uh, in climate, in case of climate change study the model can contribute to the climate change research by providing insight into the relation between the ocean ph and the environmental factors such as carbon dioxide sea surface temperature sea surface salinity and other also it can assist in uh, studying long term trend also uh, now uh, also the models output can can be utilized as a, uh, in the field of oceanography and the ocean engineering to support the design and operation uh, operation of the offshore structure now coming to the future scope the expansion of this model to the uh, to the other region that is the model can be expanded to cover the additional ocean oceanic region beyond the uh, bay of bengal uh, by collecting the data from the different region and incor incorporating them into the model uh, we will get the uh, ph value for that particular region also it can be integrated with the real time monitoring uh, by integrating the model with a real time monitoring system can enable continuous tracking of the ph level in the bay of bengal region this uh, this would provide up to date information for the environmental agencies researchers and the policy maker allowing them to respond swiftly to change uh, and make the timely decision so these are my references i have used uh, while studying this topic and at the end i conclude my presentation with the quote of barack obama we are the first generation to feel the effect of climate change and last generation who can do something about it thank you thank you thank you so much akshay for making us understand the impact and consequences of uh, ocean acidification uh, now we shall move on to the last presentation for today i would like to call kumar naik from iit guwahati to share the learning outcomes of his presentation Nayak will be presenting on the topic climate change impact in the Indian Ocean region. Kumar Nayak, kindly share your presentation with all of us. Thank you. You already have shared. You can take over. Kumar Nayak, if you're speaking, then you're not audible. Kindly unmute yourself. Hello. Yes, you're audible now. Okay, fine. Sorry for that. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Kumar Nayak. I'm first year master student at IIT Guwahati. So today I will be speaking about climate change impact in Indian Ocean region. Uh, this was the my flow of topic. And let us start with you. I will just give a brief introduction about climate change because earlier many of my fellow interns have given really uh, a good explanation of climate change. So basically, the climate change refers to the long term shifts in weather patterns like you know average temperatures or sea level uh, rise, etc. So uh, until the mid 19th century, the emissions were relatively low. However, with the start of uh, 18th mid 18th century, due to the industrialization process, there was very increasing uh, human activities uh, like productions, manufacturing. Uh, so, so to the emissions has risen significantly. So, there were uh, four important uh, greenhouse gases: carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and chlorofluorocarbonates. So, these were the sources. And in the right side, I have uh, provided a graph of of how the emissions have risen over the time. So, you can see there clearly that from the mid 19th century, the emissions have risen at alarming rate. So this was causing the global uh, climate change patterns. Uh, so my area of interest is Indian Ocean region. So let, let me give a brief introduction of Indian Ocean. Uh, so geographically, it was uh, landlocked except from southern part. And you know, around third of the world population is living in this region. And also most of these countries were developing countries. 
and when coming to ecological significance though it was rich in fisheries and marine ecosystem and marine biodiversity most of the indian region was still unexplored so you know in the upcoming future there might be new species can be discovered as well and when coming to political significance the uh, supposedly the tatan was china's uh, one one built one road initiative and you know politically it was very significant because of its membership and organizations having in that region and economic significance is really important because uh, almost 30 to 33% of the world uh, trade and shipping lanes passes through that region only and recently there was also the start of deep sea mining in this region as well which is at very early stages so it might have really good scope uh, so i have here uh, four broad questions uh, to answer the first was uh, since Uh, from literature review we have uh, learned well that there was rise in temperatures and sea level surfaces but we want to study what the changes in the indian ocean region can really do so the uh, first question is we want to uh, predict what was the economic damage and how many people it was affecting uh, and there our climate change parameter was emissions and the second question was we want to see if emissions and uh, the economic damage has any relationships so uh, and also we want to see the cause and effect relationship and uh the fourth question we want to see why india is most vulnerable country this i will let you know later i will bring, i will cut short literature review because earlier interns have really said uh, well the two important concerns about uh, indian ocean is that uh, from 1950 to 2015 there was uh, one degree rise in sea surface temperatures and also the sea levels were rising uh, at 3.28 mm per year so these two were important concerns actually so Uh, uh the data is i got uh, emissions data from global carbon pro- projects and um from who i got the disaster data i have links provided in then so my methodology includes uh, so, I, so i want to give clear that the data type i have is panel data so basically the panel data is the combination of both cross sections so here i have chosen five countries and it was time series uh, from 1976 to 2020 uh since it is panel data we have to go away with uh, the general regression models we have so we can proceed with fixed effect estimator and random effect estimators so in order to proceed uh, what to choose uh, between two we need to go for hasman test so from hasman test based on the result obtained if it is less than 0.5 then you can proceed with fixed effect estimator and have provided the governing equations here and then to see co integration test there was one conditionality of to check the stationarity the stationarity simply implies that uh you know there were two variables three variables were considered emissions economic damage and total people affected whether they were time variant or time invariant so we can check that by levin uh, levin lynch test and finally the co integration test so as i said earlier india is really the most impacted country in that region so we want to uh, take a really closer look at that so as part of that first we will have some general simple regression thing and we will do stationary test by augmented decupler test and vr the granger casualty test to see if there was any cause and effect relationship so here was a summary statistics from 1960 to 2021 so here are the five countries i have selected and the four events uh, disasters that were impacted by the uh, ocean in the in that region so as you can see clearly in that that the india is only the major uh, country that was impacting by these all, all the events uh, in the panel we have selected however even in the uh, uh, realistic data Uh, you can see india is only the country that was most impacted by any event we consider so uh, and again here is the result of fixed effect estimator these two were beta 1 coefficients so the, this implies that uh, if there was incre- uh, increase in 1 uh, 1 billion ton of emissions then it will give rise to almost 4 billion dollar economic damage through all the events that we have considered and also there will be uh, z- 0. 419 million people they, that will be affected by any of the events occurring in this region in the aggregate of five countries i mean in the panel we have selected so the levin lynch test has shown the non stationarity at level and stationarity at differences however i want to make a note that uh, only emissions and economic damage has shown non stationarity at level and stationarity at first difference so the total people affected did not show non stationarity at level this is because as there was more increase in uh, technological advances advancement and forecasting methods so we were able to successfully replace the people from the affected area so we have drastically reduced the death rates or total people i mean affecting in the region so that is why this was uh, not time invariant so we, we were able to i mean we were able to bring down the total people affected to almost uh, in some cases it was zero obviously so that is why the total, total people affected did not show that condition 
and the co-integrate co-integration test we have done it will be showing the long term relationship so uh, since the economic damage and the emissions have uh, shown uh, the non stationarity at level and stationarity at first difference the co-integration test was done in the two variables only so the uh, cow co integration test has shown significance at 0 0.001 so this was a very good result so in order to validate this i have also done the westerland test it was also shown the significance at 0 0.001 so what this implies is that both the emissions and economic damage occurring through all the events in that region will be long lasting so they will be having a very long term relationships i mean they, there can be more recurring and this can be going uh, long long further so as you, as you have seen in summary table that india is really most affecting country we want to have some closer look and this was the results of the study i have done so initially i have uh, converted the data into log values to remove any uh, uh, high values outliers or uh, to make it more uh, easy for assumptions so this was the regression values so what does that mean that 1% change in emissions will obviously give to gives rise to 1.75% of economic damage and 0.916% of uh, total people affected both both of these were uh, significant values only and as a move to see the cause and effect relationship there was two more preconditions we need to check the first was stationary state of the uh, stationarity test for uh, for this we have considered argumentary dickey fuller test so uh, again here as in panel condition we have seen only economic damage and emissions have shown uh, non stationarity at level so here also in even in india's case the same condition applied because as i said earlier the condition uh the total people affected has drastically come down with uh, technological advances in india's case also that did not show the uh, condition the second was that we need to consider some specific lag value uh, this is because uh, uh, the casualty test when, when we have done it did not show any significant result because there was some uh, due to data constraints and uh, uh, for interrelations to the previous values so i have, I have to choose lag value and all the log order uh, log prediction criteria has shown optimal at lag 2 so i have proceeded with lag 2 only and also to see if the model is uh, stable and also there was no auto correlation i have done language multiplier test so this is also uh, validated and as a final step the granger casualty test it has shown the p value of 0 0.02 0 0.042 so it this value was obviously less than 0.05 so what does mean this means that uh, the variable we have chosen emissions is indeed uh, best suitable to predict our model the total economic damage so uh, the result directly implies that there was some cause and effect relationship between emissions and economic damage and we have seen the beta values of those here were four major conclusions so the first conclusion was that both in uh, panel and india's case we was you have seen that there was significant relationship with economic economic damage and emissions and also the total people affected with the beta 1 coefficients we have and the second conclusion is that both the emissions and economic damage are having long term relationships the third conclusion is that in india's case we have done granger casualty test test has shown the cause and effect relationships so as emissions as long as they continue to increase the economic damage also persists as long as they increase the fourth point is uh, it was actually a very interesting point so since india is only the major uh, impacting uh, i mean most vulnerable country in the region so there was a striking point here is that it was also the most and uh, fastest developing country and also the uh, largest emissions country in the region so this could possibly explain why india is uh, becoming vulnerable vulnerable to this as it is increasing more emissions so the limitations of this model is that uh, we have selected only five countries uh, due to data constraints so if we choose uh, un unbalanced panel data models then we can have very regress results uh, and second is that uh, when any event occurs i mean any even uh, any disaster occurs we will be mostly looking at uh, how many people affected or what was the damage done however we will be ignoring other factors like say if there was any loss to the forest in the uh, region like you know mangroves so the upfront cost of the future cost it will derive such type of cost were ignored so that might be helpful in predicting more uh, values so these were the limitations and here was the data and references i have chosen uh, thank you
Thanks for the elaborate presentation, Nayak. Uh, it was great to hear from you. Uh, so this was the last presentation of day two of the four day webinar. Uh, and that will that that uh, MRC is hosting for our interns and fellows, and we have uh, some remarkable guests and dignitaries who have joined us. I would like to hand over to Arnab sir now. So please take over. Uh, thank you, Nishtha. Uh, again, I would like to congratulate and thank all our interns and fellows for a good presentation. I think uh, the work is slowly but surely maturing to a level where it can really uh, make some very, very strong and bold statements for the policy makers. And there is a lot of, uh, to the viewers, I would like to also uh, submit that there's a lot of documentation also parallelly that is happening. And most importantly, now we have another set of team uh, uh, who, whom we call MRC engineers. Uh, they have been contributing significantly le uh, led by Sridhar again on that front as well. But uh, we have Shreya, uh, Ayush, uh, uh, Jay, Rohit, and Rushikesh, who are uh, our back end uh, MRC engineering team. And because all these work that is being done has to be supported on two fronts, we have developed now our back end hardware and uh, software, as well as now we are also going for field uh, uh, deployment. So this team is uh, working very hard and they have shown some remarkable progress. Uh, to kind of support. I mean, now all these applications and various other uh, things that are there, they will all be available uh, 24 hours and that re does require a huge amount of work uh, at the back end. So I'm extremely happy and delighted to report to this very august audience. So I would request uh, Admiral Verma sir to give his comments on today's uh, uh, presentations. Uh, as usual, well done, MRC, um, and the interns have done a fantastic job. Uh, all of us, at least I know that climate change is taking place and it is disastrous, et cetera, but the quantification and the uh, why, uh, how to prevent it, et cetera, have, uh, you know, uh, given me an eye opener. Uh, I, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I mean, it's not my... Uh, so I don't think I'm a specialist, but uh, just a few points. Again, I won't say there's observations. I was very uh, happy to see the on Android application for AP and by by Somia. It's got a it's got multiple. I mean, it's got a, a very long uh, you know uh, use. I mean, it'll go go a long way for use for the farmers. There's only one question there I had. You have name of the species and state. Now the state coastline is quite big. So do you, how do you normalize the, you know, all the parameters for that? Uh, in the sense that, say, Andhra Pradesh coast is pretty long. So southern area where the river things are, you know, uh, river outlets are there more, and the northern, will there be changes in the parameters that you're looking for? So how a single parameter for the whole uh, uh, area, you know, coastal area, uh, is it is it uh, uh, okay or not? I don't know. It's one uh, one of the doubts that I had. A, B, of course, when you go for real-time monitoring, maybe you'll be able to, you know, get better. Uh, uh, you can choose a, a graphical uh, area, a ge geographical area can be chosen by the farmer on his Android and probably looked into. That's what I, uh, I was thinking, but I'm sure your further work will will take you there. Uh, will, will, I'm sure the further interns will add on to this application to be able to make it more and more versatile. Uh, the other thing was on the carp farming. I was very interested in seeing, I mean, I like fish. So when I saw all those fish there, it looked pretty good. And uh, I, I didn't know that we 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 have uh, so much of uh, thing. Now, only did, did, what I didn't understand was you said that the hatchery and wild. In the wild, the thing grows. Now, what do you mean by wild? Is it lake or is it just a, or some area in the sea? That's what I didn't get. Because hatchery, I can figure out. It's some restricted area. It could be even a lake. But wild, does it mean to open ocean? 
that that was the question i had then um, the uh, climate uh, climate imp impact on seaweed and uh, shrimp farming uh, I, I i'm sure all of you uh, i'm sure the mrc is already going ahead to make it a a, a tool which to make a tool uh, you know to help these wherever the farming is being done uh, what was interesting for me was the role of uda in mitigating effects of climate change because obviously at the end of it we want to fit this into this uda uh, thing and uh, deepak uh, from terry obviously being from terry is uh, he's done a lot of research and uh, thing could we now therefore since so much information and uh, etc start suggesting uh, a preventive measure you know like he said we are only doing curative measures in all these uh, thing can we suggest a preventive measure for climate change in our area as a, as a policy document or as a thing i think we could start looking at it if we have enough data and and thing that be that will put uh, uda in in a in a real uh, big uh, big leak um yeah the last one uh, which is uh, by kumar naik um i i saw the last almost the last line fast india is a fast growing economy and uh, therefore largest emission in the region is it a theoretical conclusion or thing but i i am not sure whether we are largest in the when you saying largest in the region you are talking of only the indian ocean region if it's indian ocean region i can agree because none of the other economies are functioning anyway in the indian ocean region so uh, fine but i don't think uh, a fast growing economy need necessarily be mean large emission in the region unless we are actually the largest because of our uh, uh, what do you call production or you know machine machine uh, uh, factory production and things like that have gone up or electricity can uh, yeah, yeah, we using coal based coal based energy generation or something like that so that was just only a doubt uh, Otherwise, I, it, uh, though I said that I probably go on the UDA on on the YouTube. I'm glad I attended uh, this because it's uh, it's a more interacting, more more inter, uh, thing to to see, interact, and respond. Uh, I'm sure there are specialists whom I think you should be giving time. Thank you very much, and all the best to all the interns. And I did not know. In I mean, I'm telling you again. I, because I've been also from also from IIT in my time, uh, very little econom economists used to take up these uh, challenges. Now I'm seeing undergraduate or even postgraduate economic uh, uh, economic science uh, and technology. I mean, these are energy science and technology, very nice subjects because this is relevant. This is something for the for for the people because most of us who do. some underwater something and then we go and you know do nothing about underwater afterwards but this is straight bearing on on the country and i'm glad that uh, such uh, subjects are there and there are people who take interest in the oceans and water around us thank you very much uh, thank uh, sir i would like to add a thing as verma sir said uh, that economic sciences people are coming i think i feel economics as a very diverse field and which in lot of fields we can do the work and i feel this this platform has provided us that diversity through which we can uh, work in underwater domain so i really feel thankful for uh, mrc to provide us this opportunity to work in this field yeah i agree with you radhika i was also surprised but i'm glad because i tell you finally you're the guys who will tell us what this country can do all of us technologists etc will do some technology and go and sit somewhere in google so this is this is very useful and uh, uh, it does help thank you very much thank you sir just to answer a couple of points you made sir uh, actually we missed uh, shlok nemani today so he is not available uh, uh, we are definitely working at the details of everything and uh, uh, so uh, just app is providing the information in a more concise and uh, user friendly for, uh, manner but uh, the actual uh, tool will you will be able to select a region and 
uh, as uh, uh, it will be supported with the actual data collection on the ground, it will be a very, very comprehensive yes. uh, uh, kind of a uh, system. Uh, I mean, it will be a system then. So we are working at all aspects and you can see the detailing now. I think we are getting into far more details than what you, we used to do earlier. And each of these uh, interns have contributed significantly and it is well backed by the mathematics of uh, the whole thing. So uh, definitely we are looking at uh, each and every aspect now, sir. I mean, trying to because it's a very vast thing. Sir. No, no, no. You, you, go, you go at it, uh, you know, at your pace because finally these things are not done in a day or two. Sir. And uh, you don't have the uh, uh, thing of having the interns with you throughout the year either. So you'll have to go intern with intern and go on. Yeah, but the direction is known that is very good. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, 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 Satish and I, sir, we would request you to kindly make your comments. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arnab, as well as uh, the uh, interns uh, who participated in uh, today's uh, presentations. As I had mentioned yesterday, not only me, the other experts uh, as well, that um, it is a very um, progressive uh, way of looking at the things. And um, uh, hats off to these uh, interns for uh, looking at uh, the classical subjects uh, in terms of uh, new technologies and new, uh, new way of uh, thinking. Uh, especially uh, though I am uh, from the field of ocean sciences. I never uh, uh, seen uh, comprehensively somebody is looking at uh, these problems uh, from the point of view of uh, AAML as well as uh, using the ICT technologies. So that way uh, these presentations and um, <clears throat> the interns deserves uh, appreciation and uh, congratulations for uh, their uh, different way of uh, thinking and different way of uh, looking at these uh, problems. Definitely they are of uh, more uh, application oriented, though there may be some uh, shortcomings and the scope for improvement. Uh, uh, what is important is the way they look at the uh, problems and the way, way, uh, way they try to integrate the new technologies and new tools, uh, which uh, turns out uh, more useful uh, um, products for the society. That is very highly appreciable. Um, in a way, they are, uh, uh, today's presentations, most of them are, uh, I would classify them under uh, translatory research. It is uh, based on the basic research findings, and then you translate that to something which is, uh, which is uh, applicable, which is, uh, application oriented for the society. Uh, um, those two presentations by Soumya and uh, Balaji <coughs> on those uh, uh, applications, they were uh, um, very useful. Uh, Balaji uh, was wondering whether there were uh, um, differences, in, uh, though the, the Andhra Pradesh uh, aquaculture shows a steady growth, there were differences. I would suggest that uh, uh, you look at the standard deviation of the data. And if it is, uh, those deviations are within uh, the standard deviation. I don't think um, they are just natural variations which need not be uh, worried about. That's what I feel. Uh, similarly, <coughs> sorry, uh, Deepak Kumar, uh, showed those uh, SST trends and uh, he was wondering whether uh, Bay of Bengal is uh, more warmer because of uh, the landlocked uh, nature. Uh, in fact, uh, there is much more to that. I would suggest uh, Deepak to uh, have a look at one of my earlier paper, which was published in, uh, uh, I think, uh, 20, uh, two th 2000, that's what I remember in Journal of Geophysical Research. Uh, if you just uh, search on Google uh, Shenoy et al, differences in the heat budget, uh, then rest uh, of the title I don't remember. Uh, if you can't find you, please uh, drop me an email. I will share you a, a PDF uh, where I have clearly shown that uh, 
the stratification in the bay of bengal because of the more input of uh, input of uh, fresh water from uh, ganga brahmaputra as well as uh, due to the precipitation that keeps the upper layers more stratified and uh, you need to put more uh, energy to mix that uh, water column <coughs> then it can be achieved easily in the arabian sea similarly the upwelling in the bay of bengal is much weaker compared to the arabian sea and those issues have been quantified there so that will be a very useful read for uh, uh, deepak kumar uh, similarly i really appreciate that aml application of uh, um, by ashay on uh, acidification it is very useful um, and he is trying to predict uh, the acidification using uh, i would suggest uh, rather than predicting uh, acidification i think you should concentrate more on uh, predicting each of those uh, uh, parameters which leads to the acidification especially the ph as well as uh, and also the other uh, associated parameters like uh, nutrients phosphate silicate uh, uh, oxygen etc uh, because uh, acidification is uh, some total of uh, many factors uh, so you may not uh, succeed in a single go other uh, uh, if you are unable to get those uh, uh, each parameters which are involved uh, which are influencing acidification uh, uh, there uh, and the last uh, presentation by uh, kumar naik uh, on the uh, climate impact of climate change on uh, indian ocean and uh, uh, he has um, gone into the economic losses uh, that's very useful uh, and he has uh, uh, gathered a lot of data on uh, storms and uh, floodings uh, cyclones uh, etc in india as well as the neighboring countries that's a very very uh, useful and very informative uh, uh, presentation <coughs> in the nutshell i I really enjoyed these presentations and I appreciate uh, all the interns and also I appreciate and congratulate MRC. Uh, MRC, you, I think you are, uh, you are expanding your horizons now uh, by expanding uh, the works uh, through the interns in uh, all fields of uh, work, uh, not only just the, um, so, uh, when you came and spoke to me initially, I thought you are going to only work on uh, underwater noise and uh, <coughs> um, underwater acoustics. Uh, but uh, I can see that you are expanding your horizons now and it is a good, uh, good thing to uh, keep uh, working on uh, all aspects of ocean. And I wish uh, all success for, for MRC as well as for the uh, interns uh, who completed their internships and made uh, uh, excellent uh, presentations. Uh, I am sorry that uh, I will not be able to join you tomorrow because I am going to travel uh, to Chennai. Um, so maybe some other time again we will meet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it's definitely an in-depth analysis and a uh, lot of inputs. And we have noted down, sir, uh, uh, all the points that you have made. And, sir, uh, all our presentations, even for tomorrow and day after, will be available. Uh, the recordings will be available. We'll be sharing that with you, sir. And also, okay. I mean, I will be definitely in touch with you and seeking your advice and uh, guidance on how to take things forward. And uh, uh, actually, sir, uh, in fact, in terms of selecting the projects, uh, me and Sridhar, we do make a list of things that we request uh, the interns to take up but many times the uh, interns also have some ideas so we encourage them uh, to kind of uh, uh, go ahead and work on uh, the things but uh, the fellows uh, who work with us uh, beyond this uh, are the ones whom we uh, kind of direct them on what is the upcoming project and what they need to take forward so but definitely our aim is to have a calibrated expansion uh, to cover uh, uh, the practical aspects and reach out, uh, really be able to make some comprehensive uh, policy uh, uh, recommendations. Uh, before I request uh, uh, Soman Banerjee, sir, uh, I, I think Soumya has raised her hand, so I would like to give her an opportunity. Soumya, please go ahead. Thank you, sir, for all your comments and suggestions. 
on Android application for APY analysis for stream and seaweed farming. I understand the parameters varying with the coastline of different state. So at present, we have the same parameters for all states irrespective of their coastline as it fades through API calls for updated data. But for sure, for future work, we can also use different parameters for different states like major and minor parameters affecting for the APY analysis for stream and seaweed farming. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Swami. Uh, uh, so, uh, Dr. Soman Banerjee, sir, uh, I would request you to make your comments, sir, please. Uh, am, I, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, uh, good good morning uh, or good afternoon to everybody. I am uh, uh, Commodore Dr. Soman Banerjee. Uh, just wanted to introduce myself because uh, I've joined the MRC uh, a few weeks back. And uh, I'm basically uh, an underwater operator specialist, not a technical uh, specialist, not an engineer, but I've operated sonars all my life. Also been uh, a director of INTEG, which uh, writes the tactics for the Indian Navy, and also inducted uh, all the underwater, as also the surface warfare equipment for Navy for four years, being in a directorate called DSR. That's my background. Uh, just now I deal with geopolitics, and therefore uh, I have heard these presentations yesterday and today, and I am not a uh, expert on the uh, and obviously, I'm not going to comment on IITNs and, and their contribution. It seems impossible beyond my bandwidth. But uh, <clears throat> I thought I will give a slight, slight geopolitical um, lilt to this discussion. And that was my primary um, reason for this intervention. I'm also very honored, sir, that I am in company of uh, Vice Admiral DSP Verma, which, who have revered all my, all my life. Uh, in the Navy and also uh, Shatish Shinoiji, who uh, I have uh, come across at various forums, uh, and of course, the director of uh, MRC, who was uh, doing a fabulous job in steering this project ahead. Uh, but my primary comments are purely geopolitical, uh, basically from the perspective of opportunities. Now, in uh, so far as India is concerned, uh, we have uh, targeted the Indian Ocean through Sagar and the Indian Indo-Pacific through something called Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative, IPOI. When we take, take these two initiatives, uh, basically uh, there is a lot of governance gap. When, gov when we talk about governance gap, uh, we, uh, we need data collection. And that is what we are seeing here in these two days presentation that uh, a lot of options have been provided by all the interns and how data can be collected because without the empirical data obviously no solution to any of the blue blue economy problems can be found but even if we have the data our countries in the indian ocean region do not have the capacity to even use those data and therefore we have to also provide them the implementation solutions so that is where the governance comes in so i'm extremely happy to see that the, the kind of uh, knowledge that exists here so we have been able to bridge the knowledge gap. But from knowledge gap, we have to go into the other gaps. That means we need to have make policies. We need to see how these can be implemented and uh, how we can assist the other countries. And in the process of assisting other countries, India assumes the leadership role. Today, India is looking to become a Vishwa guru or say regional guru. So that your, your technology is going to plug in there uh, as also for purpose of India as such. So that is the one point I wanted to make, governance gap. The second thing is the political economy. We are in competition with China and China has already made standards for say 4G. 40% of the patent of 4, 5G, 5G is with China today. Similarly, if we do not fill up these gaps ourselves and provide standards, whatever, whatever you have discussed in last two days, this can become standards, patent them and become standards for international application. So that when it comes to production, we show, we don't have to buy these standards from China or we don't make them because already China has embarked upon the standards plan 2035. That's China's strategy. So the second geopolitical input I wanted to give. And the third thing, and I strongly feel that 
whatever research that is happening in MRC can easily plug into IFC IOR. Uh, and somehow I have also written a small little paper on this and uh, given to. Uh, I think that that is uh, required uh, so that we can um, see how all the talent that is here can plug in uh, to IFC IOR so that uh, we become more relevant. That all, that's all, sir. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Soman, sir, thank you so much. And uh, we are <coughs> definitely extremely <coughs> grateful to you for uh, having joined us and uh, <coughs> this journey together. I think uh, MRC has also matured to an extent that uh, we will be able to give you far more concrete inputs and uh, uh, you didn't uh, mention that you have spent a lot of time with the uh, Vivekanand Foundation as well as MEA because that's very, very important uh, part of your uh, background also. And we definitely look forward to your continuous contribution in terms of your writing for MRC and already you have contributed few of them which are extremely uh, important and relevant. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, we will definitely continue this interaction and uh, there's there are far more things which i want to share with you uh, uh, in terms of our future vision and how we want to take things forward uh, anybody from the audience would like to make some quick comments okay if not uh, thank you all thank you so much and uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at 10 30. thank you very much uh, uh, Admiral Verma, sir, Satish Shanoi, sir, uh, Banerjee, sir, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Arnav, and uh, thanks to all others at MRC as well as the interns uh, who made the presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. I'm quitting. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Nishta. It was well coordinated. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.